Welcome to the grand opening of a much-needed video series, Why It's a Classic. In an age where the very concept of a pantheon of great artworks is questioned, we need to remember why some extraordinary films manage not only to survive the test of time, but prosper. Why a classic's narrative is exemplary, immortal and universal. Why a classic's visual style is a perfect display of craft, creativity and beauty. Why the story and the image you can see right there on screen are the absolute epitome of eternal excellence. This is Why It's a Classic. In our opening episode, we'll examine the great American Western, The Searchers. Someday, this country's gonna be a fine, good place to be. Maybe it needs our bones in the ground before that time can come. John Wayne plays Ethan Edwards, a Confederate veteran who spends years searching for his niece, Debbie, kidnapped by the Comanche after they massacre her family. So we'll find them in the end, I promise you. We'll find them. From the get-go, you can get why this story continues to fascinate. The Quest, the Odyssey, the Golden Fleece. It's one of the oldest story archetypes. A hero's adventure through and against nature and time to return himself or something or someone home. It's the perfect starting point, but you need some depth to help it stand out. Thus, Ethan. He doesn't want to bring Debbie back home. He wants to kill her for becoming a Comanche, because our dear hero is a racist bastard. Something that's never pushed, just made clear through passing lines and looks. They ain't white. Anymore. The Comanche. Discretion is a key concept in this film's storytelling. Alongside Ethan in the search is Martin Pauly, his foster nephew he distrusts for being one-eighth Cherokee. He's not only there to rescue Debbie, but to keep Ethan from killing her. He's a man that can go crazy well, and I intend to be there to stop him in case he does. And The Searchers is commendable for how unsentimental it is. Practically every film about two men on a mission would make them bond over the course of the story. Not this one. Come on, blanket head. After years on the trail together, Ethan won't let Marty take a drink. So I think I'd like to... While you grow up. Ethan uses Marty as bait by pretending to be kind to him, which he doesn't buy at all. Comfortable? Ethan, are you all right? Well, I'm just saying good night to you. Well, good night. Close to the end, Ethan declares he'll make Marty his sole heir, proving he got over his prejudice and finally sees his brother in arms as an equal. Marty refuses because fuck you, Debbie's your heir, you racist son of a bitch. Well, you can keep your will. I can't help but love a movie that finds the perfect chance to make a mushy scene of its two leads earning each other's respect and refuses to let it happen. I hope you die. That'll be the day. Something a film needs to become a classic is variety, and The Searchers has a major romantic subplot involving Marty and his childhood sweetheart, Lori. It's also got plenty of comic relief. Roger Ebert dislikes the non-serious detours, and Kristen Thompson finds the final switch from emotion to broad humor jarring. Ow! But I believe these changes in tone actually help the film. It gains universal appeal and a more light-hearted rhythm, and The Searchers is a masterclass of rhythm. This tale happens over a period of five years, and with a length of 118 minutes, it doesn't waste one second. Imagine how many dead ends and fruitless leads Ethan and Marty met in their adventure. We never see any of them. Time passes through the changing of the seasons, through John Wayne's gray hair, through brief lines of dialogue. You got my letter about your son Brad. Yeah, just about this time a year ago. There is no need to tire the audience to make time pass. Take the 18-minute sequence of Marty's letter, a brilliant way of advancing the plot with variety. Long stretches of time are delivered in a few minutes. We get brief scenes with voiceover narration to contrast with the typical dramatized ones. There's the character of Luke, an innocent Comanche who gets a sad ending, showing how there are victims on both sides without the need of Jeremiah's. And though they don't even meet, it strains the relationship between Laurie and Marty. That's effective storytelling. <laughs> Mind how we never see Charlie McCorry's courting of Laurie. He serenades her a second and the next time we catch them, they're about to get married. Think about it. Do we need to see a subplot that is so sub? Robert McKee explains. To de-emphasize a subplot, some of its elements may be kept off screen. 
Keep your eyes on the main plot. What if we started wanting Lori to marry Charlie? Can't hardly recognize the side. Hell no, she's Marty's. Speaking of Charlie, he arrives as a comic buffoon and soon takes pleasure in knowing that Marty got an accidental Comanche wife. He did? Coast clear. <laughs> he doesn't take kindly to Marty's one-on-one -on -one with his fiance. Oh, I'm sorry. Fiancé. I'll thank you to unhand my fiancé. Best line delivery ever. And he immediately loses interest in Laurie upon realizing she loves Marty. He's not that dumb. He's not dumb at all. It was a nice wedding party. Considering nobody got married. I mention it to point out that the film's side characters aren't as one note as one might think. There's this aristocratic Comanchero who's in only three scenes. Ethan lies to him about wanting to trade with Scar. Once he realizes they want vengeance, he rejects payment. Take it. I do not want blood money. He's on screen for some 5 minutes, has about 15 lines, most of which are exposition and translation, and he demonstrates strong principles. That's more personality than many protagonists you'll find. At your service. For a prize. Always for a prize. Tequila para todo lo. And Moe's. This over-the-top half-wit helps advance the plot twice, and the rocking chair motif leads him to have a perfect final image. Even the clown gets closure. Yes, sir! Oh, shut up, Moe's! Thank you. And here's something about the rocking chair. It's something The Searchers does likely better than any other film. It uses props to represent character, making the story even more visual. Almost every character has one object or another directly related to them. Debbie's ribbon and doll, Futterman's coins, Luke's hat, Green Hill's knife. Yes, sir! Boy! Watch that knife! Sorry, sir. Ethan recognizes Moses' horse thanks to its hat. And how is Debbie finally found by the heroes? By presenting her husband's trophies. Props drive the plot. Man, sure. And there's likely no director better at showing characters interacting with objects in the world they're in than John Ford. It's time to segue from the searcher's perfect screenplay and deal with its perfect direction. John Ford is a fan of rituals, of people solemnly doing important actions with perfection. Mind the men getting dressed for Charlie's wedding. One of the most John Ford shots that John Ford ever John Forded. A simple, white, static, one-shot take of precisely blocked men carefully interacting with all sorts of objects. Get them spurs off. No need to cut to a close-up of anything. Attentive blocking guides your eyes through the packed frame. The first close-up in the film comes seven minutes in, and it's an important prop, not a face. The closest face we ever get comes once 108 minutes in. The first close-up exchange of shot counter shot comes 41 minutes in, when Ethan tells a man his sweetheart was brutalized to death. What do you want me to do, draw your picture? Spell it out! The lengths you have to go for four to deem you close-up worthy is respectable. So you think you're close-up worthy? Yes, I I'm very close-up worthy. Run down your case for me again. Well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a funeral scene. A man just lost the woman he loves and his brother. A nephew, all brutally massacred by the tribe he hates the most. Mmm, best I can do is a very wide shot. There's no more time for Brad. Amen! Brad, Martin! Amen. He's a highly discreet director in every way. When Ethan finds Martha's body, we don't see his close-up. We don't see his face at all. We don't even see what he sees. Personally, I find the showing of emotion both easy and risky. It's often better to have the audience think about grief than witness grief. Ford understood it really well. You didn't need to see anymore because the audience can imagine much worse things than anything you can show them. And that's what Fritz Lang used to call making the audience a collaborator. Being one of the greatest directors of all time, he stages every scene with painterly precision. See this frame here. I don't like it. What don't you like? Engines on a raid generally hide their dead. And if they don't care anything about us knowing... Notice how the screen is completely filled from left to right, from top to bottom, from foreground to background. Each actor has a distinct position and dramatic pose. The moment you compose an image in such a sophisticated way, there's no need to even show a beautiful location. But he does it anyway. When Ford moves his camera, it's to follow someone's movement. 
Because your attention is centered on one person, when they move you think you're following them, not the camera. This way you might not even notice the camera moved. There is one single moment when the camera doesn't follow anyone, it moves independently to find a new focal point. It's when Marty and Charlie are fighting. We see Ethan, then the camera pans to see Glory. That instance aside, Ford's camera always follows, never wonders. Check this baroquely busy white shot. It's fine, sisters. Good morning, Lucy. Have you been baptized yet? One minute of non-stop movement by everyone, everywhere, all at once. Ethan arrives from the background, and as he approaches Reverend Clayton, the camera moves forward to make the shot more personal. Only then do we cut. Bogdanovich approves. I resent that, sir. Just funning, son. Just funning. Camera moved in following Wayne. That's again. Everything is hidden. Technique is hidden. He doesn't show you how he does it, contrary to the current fad, which is to show off directing. This is not a show off director. He's there in every second of it, but he doesn't have to jump up and down and tell you he's there. Classical directing, invisible directing, the best kind. The true masters of mise en scène can position characters, objects, and frames, like windows and doors, in ways that make everything harmonious and deceivingly simple. Check this beautifully dusky shot. Ethan's brother prepares for a Comanche raid while his wife hides the danger from their children. From this fastidious angle we see the table, the rifle, the door and the window. They will all be used. While the women set the plates, the father gets his gun and bullets to go outside. Why is that window here? For dramatic lighting and to frame our watchman outside in the background. What a shot! Ford doesn't need so much to create visual drama, though. See this shot between Marty and Laurie. She faces away, turns to him. Their body language tells everything. She goes to the foreground, doing the turn away. Sits down on the left. He says something ashamed. She stands up and hugs him. No wonder Ford started directing in the silent era. You don't need to hear a word to get the gist. Here's another impressively blocked shot. Clayton on the right, Ethan barely seen behind him. Marty goes from the middle ground to the foreground. He faces Clayton with room in the middle, to be filled up by Ethan. He soon leaves to the right middle ground, opening up space for Clayton to take Marty back to the middle ground. Marty doesn't want to be led and positions himself between Ethan and Clayton. Ethan ignores him and walks to the foreground, followed by Marty, who's followed by Clayton. The leader acquiesces to the young man, who rushes to the middle ground to prepare for his mission. Now here's something that makes John Ford even more special. You go right ahead, son. But at the first sign of an alarm, we're coming in. Clayton's conceding to Marty is represented by putting on his hat. The Searchers is chock full of this. The script makes props important, but Ford's direction makes them alive. The physicality of his characters makes the movie's world breathe. God bless it! Watch it, it's loaded. It is peopled by colorful characters who we can clearly see interacting with everything around them. Well, sister, here he is, all curried and combed and washed behind the ears. The way Ward Bond opens the door, raises his hand, removes his hat, moves it to his other hand, greets his hostess, then his host, and as he shakes his hand, he gives him his hat and stuff, then he presents the groom. He does everything as one single motion in six seconds. And John Ford was famous for shooting as few takes as possible. In this shot, Ethan smokes a cigar and approaches Clayton, unobtrusively followed by the ever-discreet camera, of course. He replaces his cigar for a coin while Clayton talks about a coin. He tosses it to Clayton, who tosses it back. Then Ethan stylishly delivers his gun. It's the simplest of dialogue exchanges and Ford makes it visually interesting by adding small but entertaining movement that illustrates the text. In this scene, Ethan arrives and is thrown a canteen, which he uses and holds throughout. As tension builds between him and Clayton, he closes the scene by throwing him the canteen. And that's an order. Yes, sir. But if you're wrong, don't ever give me another. 
using a prop to punctuate an ending. Here's an even better punctuation. In this 1910s style setup, Ethan approaches from the background, stops Marty from drinking again, and stresses he found the Comanche they're looking for like this. Scar. Now here's a totally valid question. Are these actions in the screenplay? Should I praise Ford or screenwriter Frank Nugent? In the case of this film, they're not. They're Fords. Oh! But you won't have access and time to check every screenplay ever written. So whenever this question arises, I like to praise both the director and the writer, just in case. Energy. And anyway, Ford merits respect for showing his actions at a distance, as part of a whole instead of cutting for each action. This makes the universe of the searchers become alive like few movies you'll ever see. You are given much more than an amazing story. John Ford gives you people in a time and place. A world that works, moves and changes before your eyes. It is cinema of the highest level. And will always be so. Now I'll thank you to like and subscribe to my channel. Also consider joining my Patreon and tell me in the comments which classic you'd like to see covered next. Just remember classics ended after the 60s. Thank you for watching.